Hello and welcome. We're looking at the readings for the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time, the rather exciting passage from St John, chapter 6. After hearing, this is John 6, 60. After hearing his doctrine, many of the followers of Jesus said, this is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his followers were complaining about it, and he said, does this upset you? What if you should, you, you, what if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and their life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the outside those who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. He went on, This is why I told you that no one could come to me unless the Father allows him. And after this, many of his disciples left him and stopped going with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, What about you? Do you want to go away too? Simon Peter answered, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the message of eternal life, and we believe. We know that you are the Holy One of God. This is quite an extraordinary passage. Shall we invoke the Holy Spirit? Come, Holy Spirit, renew our hearts and the face of your, the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So one of the first things that happened when Jesus spoke like this was that a number of the people who were going around with him, who followed him, who were attracted to him, they left. They, they found this worldview too difficult. They couldn't contain it in the world of their own presuppositions. And that continues to be true today. This emphasis that Jesus has on the spirit on the one hand and the flesh on the other. We need to make a few distinctions, of course, because not all spirit is good. There's a German word for spirit, Geist, often used for the spirit of the age. The Romantics were very much, in the 19th century, invoking the spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit. They were particularly excited by the spirit of nature, for example. And the flesh is sometimes good and sometimes bad. What Jesus was doing was making a distinction between relying on our own powers. For the last 500 years we've lived in a culture, the culture of the Enlightenment, which has put rationality on a pedestal. We like to believe what we can conceive of and anything we can't conceive of, anything that, that, that takes us further than our preconceptions, we find immensely difficult. Our whole culture is predicated on this and indeed the atheists we live amongst are, are the most developed people in this regard. They want proof, empirical proof, although we already know there are so many things that, that can't be proved empirically. Science, for example, can't tell you if you're in love with someone. Science can make a nuclear bomb and it can make a vaccine, but it's the same science. It has to be directed by will and, and intelligence and for good. And science has no means of telling us the difference between good and evil. Rationality, simple empiricism, isn't good enough. There has to be something more. There has to be an intelligence and a holiness driving who we are. St Augustine deals with this rather beautifully. He was dealing with the same problem about what we do with this distinction between spirit and flesh. And, uh, and he's, he's very helpful, as Augustine always is. Let's turn to him. What is it then that, he, that Jesus adds? It is the spirit that quickens the flesh, profits nothing. Let us say to him, for he permits us not contradicting him, but desiring to know, O oh Lord, good master, in what way does the flesh profit nothing? While you have said, except a man eat my flesh and drink my blood, he shall not have life in him. Or does life profit nothing and why are we what we are but that what we may have eternal life which thou dost promise by thy flesh then what means it that the flesh promises nothing it profits nothing but only in the manner in which they understood it 
They understood the flesh just as when it's cut to pieces in a carcass or sold on the marketplace, not flesh quickened by the spirit. So when it said the flesh profits nothing, it said in the same way as knowledge puffs up. So should we hate knowledge? Augustine goes on, or far from it. What does it mean knowledge puffs up? Knowledge alone without charity does that. So he added, but charity edifies, see St Paul 1 Corinthians 8. So to add knowledge and charity, knowledge will become profitable, not by itself, but through charity. So here, when Jesus says the flesh profits nothing, only when it's by itself. Let the spirit be added to the flesh, like charity is added to knowledge, and it profits very much. For if the flesh profited nothing, the word could not be made flesh to dwell amongst us. In other words, Augustine goes back to the incarnation. Jesus took flesh, the word became sarks. A theological word that on the whole means life without God. But when, when Jesus, when the word takes flesh, the flesh is then enlivened. When love infuses knowledge, knowledge doesn't puff up anymore. In other words, our bodies, our way of being, our flesh, our ordinary life can become useful only and when it's infused by the Holy Spirit. St Ephraim of Sorov, a, a Russian Orthodox saint who lived in the 19th century, was famous for saying that the most important thing to do as a human being was to acquire the Holy Spirit. And he taught his, for his followers how to do that. He said, you must examine yourselves and see whether fasting or praying or waiting on God or, or giving your goods away. Check which of these things increases the Holy Spirit in you most. And whatever does it, do that. But above all, concentrate on acquiring the Holy Spirit. So, of course, our bodies, our self-reliance are nothing. But when our bodies are infused by the Holy Spirit, then we become agents for good. Jesus sent the 72 disciples out. He sent their bodies out. But he sent them out infused by the Spirit. And it's this infusion by the Spirit that's so important for us as Christians. And yet the trouble is, so many of the ways in which we read the Bible are not infused by the Spirit. I was listening to someone who's become a Christian talk about the way they've begun to say the Lord's Prayer three times a day, and quite rightly, but got stuck in the night because as they went to bed and they said, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, they said, well, I've had my three meals for the day already, so perhaps I shouldn't pray the Lord's Prayer at night. Well, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, what you see is the word that Jesus uses for daily is epiusios. Give us our epiusios bread. It's made up of two Greek words, epi and usios. They're rather exciting. Well, usios is a rather exciting word. Eh, epi is a, is a prefix, but usios is, means being. So give us our super being bread. Well, this might have been bread for the day. Certainly Jerome translated it as that, quotidianum. But he, but he translated it in two ways. And so Jesus, of course, talks about himself being the living bread. It's hard not to think that if you read the Lord's Prayer in the Spirit, then to pray for daily bread is to pray for the, the super substantial, the supernatural bread for this day. And that's Jesus himself. And so we go, Father, here I am, your child. Hallowed be your name, let the holiness sanctify my mouth, my, my mind, your kingdom come, your will be done. These are things of the Spirit on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the living bread. That's Jesus. We come to the Father and we ask him to direct to give us Jesus to feed on. Well, the people listening to Jesus saying you need eat my flesh or else you have no life in you were profoundly upset by this. It sounded like cannibalism. Now there are two words for to eat in Greek. One means eat in the ordinary sense. The other the other means more gnaw. Really, really dig in to what you're to what you're doing, what you're eating. Jesus used the word to gnaw, gnaw my flesh. Revolting if you take it in the flesh, but in the spirit it's consumed me with profundity and everything you've got. And of course, one of the arguments between Protestantism and Catholicism is whether John 6 means is orientated towards the Eucharist. And, 
It seems to me that Catholics read it in the spirit and Protestants read it in the flesh. Protestant Christianity is rooted in so many ways in the empiricism of the Enlightenment and finds it very difficult to, to inherit and inhabit the spiritual mindset that the church over one and a half thousand years developed. The moment you read John 6 in the light of the Holy Eucharist, it all makes complete sense. As, as does the Lord's Prayer, it is Jesus and his living bread that we're after. And this only happens in the miracle of the transformation in the Mass. It happens, of course, in the miracle of the transformation of the words of Scripture. To read the words of Scripture is also to have to feed, to gnaw on Jesus, the living bread. And yet in so many ways we take this rationality, this, this flesh, this, this self-sufficient capacity for interpreting Scripture according to our presuppositions. It seems to me happens in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, we read in Matthew. Well, the, the poor in, in the Old Testament were almost always the, the spiritual poor. Sometimes they were the economically poor. But, but the, the Bible is most interested in the poor in spirit. So St Luke adds poor in spirit, just in case you didn't understand it. But so many people in the 20th century have understood the Beatitudes in the flesh, politically, sociologically. What do you make of those who mourn? All the time in, in funeral services, it's taken to be those who bereaved. But this can't be the meaning. Uh, of course, it doesn't exclude those who bereave. But the mourning that the Bible knows is the mourning of, of a sin, lamentation of repentance. Of course, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we come to Christ in penitence for all that's gone wrong and we mourn. In the spirit, it's about our relationship with God the recognition of our broken relationship. St Paul in Romans talks about this distinction between spirit and flesh, and he does it with his wonderful clarity. For those who live according to the flesh, the sarks, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on life in the spirit. He begins by telling us there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. God's done what the law, weakened by flesh, sarks, self-reliance, could not do. So, we who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, are justified. If we set our, our, our lives, ourselves, on the Spirit, there is this constant gravitational pull to pull us back into this, this world of self-reliance, of muscular intellect, of trying to fix things by politics. And although, although sometimes Christians have separated themselves from the world to try and live spiritual lives, we can't, of course, separate ourselves from the world. But what we must do is try to infuse the world with the spirit in the same way that charity infuses knowledge, in the same way that the incarnation infused the flesh. We bring Jesus into whatever we do, but on the terms of Jesus and the incarnation, not on terms of the political process itself. The Magnificat has also often been taken to be a political uh, statement, a political thesis, and yet it is in fact only understood properly in the spirit. Mary is going to be the antidote to the pride of Eve. She's going to be the new Eve. The Magnificat is a song of the new Eve. The old Eve was uh, indeed set the pattern for self-reliance, for making up her own mind, for doing our own thing. And it's Mary who comes along and in this extraordinary way, infused by the Holy Spirit, lives a life of humility and dependence where she becomes the one woman to say to the Lord, so be it to me according to your will. The very words we find set out at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Mary the new Eve, Mary the new tabernacle. This teaching of Jesus that we must live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, 
that we must eat his body and drink his blood to have life in him propels us either into the world of the spirit and reliance on the spirit or else into the world of the flesh and of the parameters of our own mind our own competence our own understanding where we either leave the Jesus entirely or we leave the Jesus of the New Testament acquire the Holy Spirit since it said St Seraphim one of the wonderful things about the Catholic tradition that I have discovered is that it comes at the gospel it comes at the New Testament with a reliance on the Holy Spirit that although I thought uh, was accessible uh, in the world of Protestantism and particularly in the world of charismatic Protestantism turns out not to be it and in particular this great miracle of the Eucharist this great supreme act of the spirit where the flesh the bread the matter is infused by Jesus in a way that the conjunction of which is entirely miraculous if only we could go back to Zwingli and to, to Luther and to Calvin and say we can now measure what happens because we've taken hosts that have begun to bleed spontaneously and for those who don't know what I'm talking about, look up the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires in 1994, where 2,000 years of Eucharistic miracle was, uh, was, uh, was followed up by this extraordinary event uh, that followed the pattern of the churches before, where hosts bled. And when they were taken for analysis, living white blood cells were discovered in the bread. The spirit had enlivened the bread. The Holy Eucharist is indeed a miraculous act where the Spirit brings life because where matter is infused by the Spirit we have the Kingdom, we have life. Give us this day our epiusios bread, our supernatural, our super substantial, our holy, our, the, the bread of the new being. Um, and uh, and so in in the light of this spiritualized understanding of the relationship between flesh and spirit of the relationship between bread and the life of Christ we come to him with renewed appetites to feed on him come Holy Spirit enlighten our minds infuse our bodies transform our wills and as St. Seraphim said, dedicate your lives to acquiring the Holy Spirit. Whatever it is you find works for you, do more of it. Only if we live in the life of the Spirit can we prepare ourselves to be saved in the economy of the Kingdom of Heaven. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.